Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our program, a Juneteenth tribute to James Baldwin with authors James Campbell, Clifford Thompson, and host and author Jewel Gomez. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at the Candix Institute of San Francisco. And we're very proud to co-sponsor this event with the American Library in Paris with a special thank you to Audrey Chapuis, Director, and Alice McCrum, Program Manager. We are also thrilled that today we have heard that Congress has passed a bill so that Juneteenth will be a national holiday. Uh, so this is, it's a, it's a great day to commemorate. Uh, if you're new to Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854 and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, and ongoing author and literary programs, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. Our library is now open, so please come down and see us, um, enjoy the library, come to our programs, uh, and also continue watching us on Zoom. But first, uh, I'd like to introduce our CEO, Kimberly Scrofano. Great, thank you so much. I just wanted to say a quick thank you to all of our esteemed guests, and I've had the opportunity to read some of all of your works, which I really appreciate. And in fact, this is a great honor for me. James Baldwin was um, a very sort of important part of uh, my academic as well as sort of literary journey from reading Giovanni's Room for the first time in high school. So it's been, you know, it's, it's a real honor to have everyone here and thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, James Baldwin's personal life and literary legacy are explored through his diverse lifelong relationships, friendships, and muses, his frontline political activism, and his cross-cultural connections and influences while living in Paris will be talked about today. It just seems like a perfect time to be talking about him and bringing his work and his life back to the forefront. I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Uh, we have James Campbell, who is author of This is a Beat Generation, New York, San Francisco, Paris, and Exiled in Paris, Richard Wright, James Baldwin, Samuel Beckett, and others on the left bank. And also Invisible Country, A Journey from Scotland. Um, and also James has been the editor uh, for many years and a columnist uh, with the Times Literary Supplement in London. Welcome from London, James. Thank you. Um, also, we have Clifford Thompson, whose work has been um, published in Best American Essays 2018, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Street Penny Review, and The Village Voice. He is recipient of the Whiting Award for Nonfiction and teaches at New York University, Sarah Lawrence College, and also the Bennington Writer Seminars. He is the author of Twin of Blackness, a memoir, Love for Sale and Other Essays, and Signifying Nothing, a novel, and most recently, What It Is, Race, Family, and One Thinking Black Man's Blues, and he's joining us from Brooklyn, New York. Welcome, Clifford. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. And our host today is Joel Gomez, playwright, novelist, poet and cultural worker, is the author of eight books, including the Black Lesbian Vampire novel, The Gilda Stories, and her trilogy of plays about African-American artists uh, in the first half of the 20th century, uh, include Waiting for Giovanni, which was produced in 2011 uh, at the New Conservatory Theater Center in San Francisco, and then later produced in New York at the Flea Theater. Um, the other plays include Leaving the Blues and Unpacking in P-Town, uh, also commissioned by the Con New Conservatory Theater Center. Um, and she was also the artist and playwright in residence there. So please welcome our guests. Jewel, take it away. 
Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, Mechanics Institute for offering us a forum to talk about James Baldwin on this most auspicious day. Uh, and it's a very, it's always exciting to me to get to talk about James Baldwin out loud and particularly with these uh, two uh, writers. So I, I, I think what we'll do is start by thinking out loud about the personal elements that maybe drew you to Baldwin. I know, uh, Clifford, you talk in your book about uh, jo Joan Didion and, and her quote, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And I would say that is quite an apt quote for Baldwin. What about mm. him drew you personally? Well, um, I, I have to say, I came to Baldwin uh, comparatively late. Um, when I was... Uh, uh, 24. I was 24 when, when Baldwin died in the in, uh, fall of 1987. And um, at that point, I, I you know, I, I can't remember a time when I didn't know who he was, but it, it took me, um, it took me a while to get to his work. I'd very, I'd read very little by the time um, he, he, uh, he died. Um, but as it happened, I worked for, I was an editorial assistant at uh, uh, what was then called Bantam Double Day Dell. And, um, uh, uh, the, the editor I worked for, Marshall De Brule, was uh, uh, pretty well connected, and, and one of the friends he had was uh, Gloria Jones. Uh, Gloria Jones was then working as a, a, a kind of a, a consultant for, you know, a freelance consultant for uh, for uh, Bantam Double Adele. She was also, of course, uh, the widow of James Jones, the writer, uh, one of one of uh, Baldwin's uh, friends in in Paris, um, and so. Uh, when Baldwin died, uh, I was sitting at my desk at work, and uh, one day my boss, Marshall, came in and said, uh, James Baldwin died. His funeral is going to be at the, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. You and I are going. So um, I said, uh, okay. And, and uh, you know, I, I put on my one suit, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we got picked up by a limousine and taken to this, uh, taken to uh, the, the memorial service, which, you know, by all rights, I had no right to be at, because I, you know, I, I just... Uh, there were so many luminaries there, uh, but I mean, it was it was such a grand event um, that that I'll, I'll never forget it. Um, embarrassingly, that did not start me on on this uh, kind of Baldwin reading, you know, tear. But uh, an editor who was a friend of mine at uh, Bantam Double Adele uh, one day brought to my desk, I think, a nine or ten paperback uh, uh, um, copies of of Baldwin's books, and I spent the following summer just consuming those things, and I've read most of them, you know. Uh, repeatedly since and um, and and to answer your question um Baldwin struck me as the he, he was like the the first literary writer I had encountered who just uh opposed prejudice with every with everything he had but also emphasized the you know the need to not be prejudiced oneself to you know as he put it to keep one's heart free of bitterness and and I just I fell in love with that message, and I fell in love with his his writing style, and 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 just the the rhythm and the music of the sentences, and uh, um, so that that was mm. that 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 gift of those books changed my life. I have to say. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 absolutely. James Campbell, would you uh, give us a sense of what personally drew you to Baldwin? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I encountered Baldwin when I was a student at Edinburgh University. I was a student of American literature, mm. and there was a very uh, far-sighted course, which included uh, not only Black literature, uh, Jewish American writing, and Native American writing, as well as uh, lots of other things you can imagine. This was in the mid-70s. And we were expected to read a tremendous amount uh, at the time, which is very good. And um, I opened up uh, the fire next time on a train, as it happens, from my parents' house back to Edinburgh, where I was studying. And um, I can still remember, I can still remember the impact of the opening sentences on that train. It was a voice that, that spoke to me, and these things are mysterious, I, I must say. Um, 
And then I, I went on, of course, to you know, read him at university, but I, I also read a huge amount outside of university. And I read everything by Bob. I, I went in search of articles by him, this is, of course, well before the days of the internet. I went into the National Library of Scotland and dug out old magazines and found interviews and everything that wasn't included in books. And, um, uh, and, and it was thrilling to me. That's, that's really the one. He, he thrilled me. Mm. Um, and when I, uh, only a, a year or so later, I, I am, um, hello, <laughs> am I still there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, here we are. I, I just didn't see you for a moment. Um, a year or so later, I was still at university and um, I was an older student than most of the others. And it was during the Easter holidays at Edinburgh, I think the year was 1978. And I felt rather lonely and I decided I had to make some new friends. And so I decided to make a friend of James Baldwin. Mm. And I wrote him a letter. And I told him what his writing meant to me. Uh, um, and I invited him uh, to Edinburgh University to speak to the students. Now I was a student myself. And of course, in those days, there was no fund or anything. There was no way of doing this. You know, there was no Department of Creative Writing or anything like that in Edinburgh. So it was a ridiculous proposition. I had no money myself. I, you know, I didn't know how, how would you get somebody from the south of France to Edinburgh? How would you <laughs> put him up somewhere decent? How would you pay, pay him a fee? But anyway, I wrote, and uh, to my um, surprise, and uh, despair, he accepted. <laughs> and he wrote back, or uh, actually his assistant, Bernard himself, whom I came to know uh, well later on, wrote back and said, Mr. Baldwin would like to come and speak to the students at the University of Edinburgh um, between certain dates. Well, you know, that really gave me a big problem <laughs> because we had nowhere to put them, nowhere to get them there. I know where to get them back and uh, no, nothing to feed them with and so on. <laughs> but uh, I decided just to let it happen. Uh, whatever happened, if James Bolden was going to come to Edinburgh, I wasn't going to stop him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but, it, but in some ways, luckily, uh, it's kind of disappointing, but fortunate at the same time. He cancelled at the last minute, but he asked me to telephone him in uh, Saint Paul de Bons in the south of France, right? beside Nice, right on the Mediterranean. And I called him from a telephone box in Edinburgh with a pile of coins, you know, making an making a international phone call in those days was a big mm. event, especially for someone like me, totally poverty stricken. Anyway, I called him and he was very, very kind, he was very, very nice. And we had a lovely conversation. I, I came out of the the telephone box. I went into the telephone box as Clark Kent and I came out as Superman. <laughs> <laughs> it was the greatest telephone call of my life. <laughs> um, a few months later, I uh, graduated from university and I became the editor of a magazine called the New Edinburgh Review, which is quite a well-established magazine in Edinburgh. And I, I wasn't there long before a book arrived in the office um, called The Making of Jazz by James Lincoln Collier, big, big book. So I packed it into an envelope and I sent it off to the south of France. And I said um, to Baldwin, and, and I think this was very important. Um, I said, you have written, made many allusions to jazz in your writings, but you've never written a separate essay on the subject. And, and maybe you would welcome the opportunity to do so. Um, it took a long time, maybe three months or something, but uh, then I got a reply from him, which was actually scribbled on the bottom of my own letter, which said, would love to do a long piece. Can't meet the deadline. Mm. 
Well, of course, there was no deadline. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't said to James Baldwin, look, if you can't give us this piece by the end of June, we're not publishing it. You know. <laughs> But anyway, uh, he said, call me in St. Paul de Vos. His telephone number as before, and I did. And um, I, rang, I rang him up, and this, that began the first of many phone calls. And they went, I won't rehearse them all, of course, but they went basically like this. I would ring up, and it was, of course, it, it took a huge amount of courage to ring James Baldwin's number from Edinburgh in the And I would ring up and somebody would answer the phone and say, hello. I say, oh, may, may I speak to Mr. Baldwin, please? He say, who's calling? I say, oh, uh, my, <clears throat> my name is James Campbell. I'm calling from Edinburgh. And then a minute later, Holden would come on the line and say, hey, baby, how are you? <laughs> I said, oh, I'm very well, thank you. <laughs> and how are you? <laughs> say, I'm working on the piece, baby, I'm working on the piece. Said, oh, well, that's fantastic. I said, call me Tuesday. Said, okay, I would call him Tuesday and we go through the same thing again and say, Come, I'm working on it, baby. Call me Frank. <laughs> <laughs> and I would do so each time, by the way, taking a huge emotional effort. And he said, I'm working on it, baby. I'm working on it. Call me man. <laughs> and I kept doing this. And we, uh, the magazine came, it was a quarterly magazine. It came out every three months. So there was plenty of time to prepare things. And uh, we got the cover printed. And by the way, I'll show it right here. Mm. All right. If you can see it, mm -hmm. we got the cover printed. Uh, just that was just as a cover. Um, it says James Baldwin on jazz. Nice, nice picture. And uh, so I, I called him as usual. He said, "I'm working on it, baby. I'm working on it." I said, "Well, that's fantastic because you know we got the cover printed and we got your photograph on the cover." I said, I'm on the cover, man. <laughs> I said, well, of course you're on the cover. He said, oh, baby, can I get the work? <laughs> <laughs> so he wrote the piece. He wrote the piece and um, he sent it in. And I think uh, he was happy and we were happy and we printed it. <laughs> and, uh, and thereafter, we, we became friends after that. So that was my initial relationship with James Baldwin Howard School. <laughs> yeah, that was that was really a lovely story. Both both of those are lovely stories. And I too was at the funeral, but I was outside because mm. okay. I wasn't invited, obviously. <laughs> but there were hundreds of us outside and that to me was the most moving thing. All mm. of these friends of mine who lived in the surrounding area, many of them were in theater, mm. just we just stood there crying mm -hmm. and I knew something by the surrounding people of the value of Baldwin more so than listening to any of the speeches. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. What I wanted to go on to the, the thing about language um, and both of you have I have talked about the significance of his language and can you uh, tell me about what you think the difference is in how he was received uh, initially? Because I, I see his reception in three phases. The initial uh, excitement, enthusiasm, and then some kind of like pulling back a little bit and a recurrence con in our contemporary times of an interest in his work. And I think it has, some of it has to do with his political positions, but also to do with the complexity of his language. What do you think are the different perceptions and receptions to Baldwin's work uh, over the years? Mm. Either, either person who wants to jump in. Clifford, <laughs> if you would like to. Well, let's see. Um, I mean, I, I tell me if you agree with this, James. Um, I, I think uh, it's probably not separate from um, um, the, the changes in 
and tone of, uh, of, of Baldwin's work over, over the years, you know. Um, so, yeah, his first book was uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain and, and um, uh, the novel Go Tell It on the Mountain. And then uh, he published, um, I think three years later, um, the, the essay collection Notes of the Native Son. And that, uh, you know, the, the title essay, which is one of my favorite pieces of writing, possibly my favorite piece of writing in the world, um, um, struck this tone that was, um, it, it, was, it was very head on and honest about, uh, about, about racism and, and, and the effects of racism in America and the effects of racism um, on, on the black community, while also, you know, I, I used that phrase of, of, uh, of Baldwin's a few minutes ago, um, uh, keeping, you know, keeping my heart free of bitterness, uh, which is how he, he ends the essay. And I think um, he was embraced uh, for for that for that book, I think because um, it, you know, I think white people certainly uh, those who read Baldwin certainly embraced this idea of well, you know, here's somebody who's shedding light on 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 racism, but but you know he 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 doesn't seem to hate me, you know, <laughs> and I think this was an attractive uh, idea for a lot of people, um, and uh, as. You know, as as as, uh, as the decades went on, um, and he, I, I think he, I think he found it very difficult to keep his heart entirely free of, of bitterness. I think the the nineteen sixties was a uh, was a brutal decade um, in in terms of uh, in in terms of what was happening racially. I mean, we you know we think of it as a decade of great progress, which it was, but it also saw you know the assassinations of Medgar Evers and and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and and uh, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, Nixon was elected uh, with the Southern strategy in '68, and I think all of this, you know, there, there's definitely a, a, a change in tone in in his writing. Um, so he, you know, he published uh, "The Fire Next Time," which is possibly his most celebrated work in, in 1963. And in it, he called for, you know, it, it was it was a searing indictment of racism, but it, but he also called on on black people to to love white people, not for the sake of loving white people, but for, for the sake of, of you know, opening uh, uh, white people's eyes to what was happening in the country and, and, and thereby um, helping to change it. And, um, and then, you know, nine years later, he published um, uh, No Name in the Street, which, um, and, and, and the, the, the shift in tone is, is, is just so uh, distinct. You know, I, you know, the, the, uh, the fire next time kind of ends with basically the message, look, you know, if you don't, if, if we don't change the way we're going, you know, um, there's going to be hell to pay, you know, the, the, you know, no more water, the fire next time. I feel like the, I feel like the message in, in no name in the street was basically too late. Mm. You blew it, you know, and, um, and I, and I think some of the people who, who embraced, this is just a theory, but I think some of the people who embraced uh, the message in, um, no of native son and and the fire next time uh, we're not so quick to embrace you know this this later this later bald one who who just you know was was just starting to wash his hands of the whole thing you mm -hmm. know so so I think uh, um, but you know I, and I, but I think in recent years as 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 more people have you know there's there's the term woke which you can't escape from but as more people <laughs> have <laughs> have sort of become woke you know they they are you know. Uh, Baldwin is being has been rediscovered by a lot of people and and uh, and and seen as this, a, a kind of a prophetic prophetic voice. So that's my that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. James, what are your what are your thoughts on on his perception through the ages? I guess we could mm -hmm. say. Uh, well, it, it, it's difficult to improve on that very thoughtful reply from Cliff. Uh, I would. I would say that uh, Baldwin's early style is much commented on. Um, references are made to Henry James, to, the, to Hemingway, uh, to the King James Bible even. Uh, I think it came out of Baldwin's character. It came out of a natural eloquence and a natural sophistication. It's, it's, it's strange, it's mysterious, but he was, in a way, the chosen one. He was born to it. 
And of course, he worked hard. Uh, all, all great writers, all geniuses have to work as hard as the common journeyman mm. to make their writing um, as good as they, as good as it deserved to be, uh, in respect of the gift. Baldwin's gift was enormous. Um, and all through the 50s, uh, into the 60s, into the, uh, as Cliff mentioned, the far next time, into the mid 60s, this gift sustained Baldwin magnificently. He really was the biggest thing. He was the, he was the biggest thing in American writing. And we're talking about mainstream writing and, and the colleagues with whom he associated, Norman Mailer and James Jones and Gore Vidal and Trude Capote and, and these people. Um, Baldwin was a mainstream writer. And for a little while, he was the biggest thing. Fashion changes, of course, very, very quickly, especially in America. And as Cliff mentioned, uh, the, the events of the 1960s bore down on his head with a tremendous weight. And it affected his writing, there's no question about it. Now, there's an essay he wrote, I think it was about 1963. Uh, it was first published in an English newspaper called Why I Stopped Hitting Shakespeare. It's a little bit of a controversial title. But um, in that essay, he says, I've always been attracted to it. It's not well known, it's not in any of the books except the later. Uh, Library of American Collections, but I've always been attracted to it. And he says something along the lines, I can't quote it straight, but he says, uh, I started to distrust the language because I suspected that the language could not bear the brunt of my experience. Now, here was a, here was a great master of English prose style saying, that English prose could not bear the brunt of my experience. This is a very challenging moment. Mm. This, this could have been one of the great moments of American literature, of literature in English, really. Because Baldwin was setting out to forge a new style. Mm. And Cliff make, made reference to that in terms of, uh, in respect of No Name in the Street, which is a book I loved when I read it. I, I, honestly, I read it on the train. It's another book I read on the train. I read The Fire Next on the Train. But I read that book on the train from Edinburgh to London. And I remember I was coming to the last pages and the train came into London. It's a five hour journey. I didn't want to get off the train because I still had a few pages left to read. You know, that was the way of these things. Um, but then there were, there were other books, uh, but there were other. With, with the passing years, it, it's, uh, it, it's sad to relate it, but with the passing years, there were further traumas. And I think that these traumas took a, a heavy toll on Baldwin's style. Mm -hmm. I think they took a heavy toll on his character, not on his character, but on his, uh, on his daily life, on his personality, mm -hmm. on his... Mm -hmm on his life as a human being, he was the greatest human being I've ever met. It took a heavy pull, the assassinations that were mentioned and the, the despair in the realization that things were not getting better yeah. as the young man had. Now, if only this new style had come into being, um, I think it would have been a great event, but I, I know that there's a kind of new orthodoxy, uh, critical orthodoxy, if you like, that um, Baldwin's later style has been misunderstood. Um, and I, I'm afraid I can't quite go along with that. I, mm -hmm. I don't think that the, the later books are as good as some people say they are. Um, but I do think that the intention to forge a new style was there. And uh, it's a 
it, it, it's sad that it didn't take place. That's my mm -hmm. feeling. Can I, I want to um, ask a, a, a question. I, I do want to get back to that the later period because I, I think there is some, some real significance there. Um, but I want to ask if either of you feel like his, uh, Baldwin's being in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know anyone who could be in Paris and not be affected, <laughs> um, but do you see how it may have affected his either writing style, his perspective, in his, certainly in his younger years, it, it gave him a, a sense of belonging somewhere. Um, how, how do you see Baldwin in Paris as a, a, an effect on his writing and his life? I, I, um, um, I, I was just gonna say, I, I um, go back often to, uh, to uh, his essay, uh, Equal in Paris, which was published in, uh, in uh, Notes of a Native Son. And uh, th that essay is, it, it's, it's a, just a wonderful, gorgeous essay. Um, and he talked, so the, the, the story that he, that he tells in the essay is, is of the time that he, uh, he was arrested. He spent eight nights in a Paris jail because mm -hmm. uh, a friend of his had, uh, had moved to uh, the hotel where, where Baldwin was staying. Uh, he had come from another hotel and he brought from the other hotel a, a sheet, uh, a, a, a bed sheet. Uh, which he which he lent to Baldwin because uh, he Baldwin was having trouble getting his linen changed. So um, oh. so um, one day uh, Baldwin went up to uh, this this guy's room, um, uh, you know, to see if he wanted to have a drink or, or dinner. And uh, there were two policemen there, and uh, they they were searching for something. And uh, they they said to Baldwin, "Oh, do you mind if we search your room?" And Baldwin said, "Sure, you know, suit yourself." So he didn't know why, but uh, they went down to his room and uh, and they found the sheet, which is what they had been looking for. And um, and as a result of that, Baldwin spent eight nights in a Paris jail. And he, he tells the story of how um, he had come from New York in, in the late 1940s. And um, at that time, he, you know, he was a young man in New York and it was the late 1940s. And there was a uh, th there was a certain way that he knew to behave to get along you know, uh, under, under racist conditions in, in, uh, in New York. Um, but he was now in Paris and he, and he didn't know what rules to follow, you know? So uh, as, as he, so, you know, it was like, he, he realized he had been playing this role a lot of the time in his, in his younger life, according to, uh, you know, that was sort of dicti dictated by, by racist forces in the land of his birth. But now he was in this place where he didn't know the rules and and he, as he put it, um, he you know, it's it's possible to get by, or or, or as he put it, um, I knew how to be a what, but I didn't know how to be a who. In other words, he knew how to play this role, but um, when he was placed in a situation where he didn't know what, what was happening, suddenly he had to figure out not what he was, but who he was, and and this this seemed to be a great. Um, this seemed to have a profound effect on him, you know, and and, and I think it, I think it, you know, I'm, I'm theorizing now, but I think it lent him a certain, a certain distance from his own past that that kind of allowed him to see maybe see see it in a new light and 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 possibly a little more clearly. So it, you know, he had to leave the land of his birth in order to really see what he had been through. Yeah. Um, so that that's that would be my my take. Yeah, on that. I think so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it is uh, it is indeed a wonderful essay. It's part of a group of fantastic essays in that collection. Um, and I like very much your account of it. Uh, to think to think of uh, the police forces of Paris descending on a hotel to yeah. investigate the theft of a bedsheet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, you, you're scratch, we're scratching our heads, you know. Um, yeah. Was there was there was there so little crime in Paris? Right. <laughs> right. My goodness. Apparently. But, um, anyway, uh, uh, well, Baldwin's um, retreat to Paris in 1948. It 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 surely was an escape from 
racism in New York. Uh, there is a letter that he wrote to William Phillips, uh, the editor of Partisan Review, which I quoted a little bit of my book, which it just it states it explicitly. You know, the situation with, with housing and everything else had just become too much. And he won an award, um, partly thanks to Richard Wright, and he set off. And by the way, he took the plane, which was very unusual in 1948, 47, in fact, I think it was. Uh, he took the plane, um, which cost a fortune, and uh, arrived there and fell into the company of Richard Wright and other kind of bohemian people on the left bank of Paris straight away. So it was a, in that way, it was a tremendous stroke of luck. And um, it was liberating, would be the simple word. Here he was with these uh, young American people, young British people, many of whom I met in the course of writing book, um, a young Swiss German, uh, Lucien Happersberger, who uh, was a very lively presence and a great friend, and, uh, and, and writerly types. Um, I, I don't mean that in any denigrating way. I mean, there were lots of, lots of writers who later published books, not to mention Richard Wright, but leaving him aside, lots of young Americans at the time, Otto Friedrich was one, published many, many books later, and wrote, a, by the way, a tremendous diary account, hundreds of old in, in Paris. Uh, very, very amusing. Um, but they were hopping around the cafes, it was a great life, a great life. And um, Parisians, they didn't really care. They, they ignored him in the way that at times they ignore everybody. You know, even when you want to attract their attention, they ignore you. <laughs> and and uh, he didn't want to attract their attention except when he wanted another drink. Um, so, so I think he had a great time. I think he had a great time. And I think he was a very serious artist. And it, uh, nothing could have been better than his sojourn in Paris. But of course, it was double-sided. Mm. It was double-sided because on the other side of the coin, he being politically aware young man, uh, there was great events unfolding in America. And what am I doing here? Swanning in and out of cafes, you know, um, ordering another something or other, uh, stealing bed sheets, except he didn't, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so there was there, so there was another side to it. But it what what it uh, strikes me as now when I look at it and when I looked at it at the time originally, it was it's part of the great drama of Baldwin's life. Baldwin's life was full of drama, enviable. Oh, and you know, it, sometimes it was a torment to him, but boy, there was drama, you know. There he was in Paris, practically penniless. His first novel was published in New York. Now he was writing a second one with all white characters, a, a gay love affair at the center of it. He'd just written a play, The Amen Corner, which was being put on. Now he had to get back to America to, uh, to take a look at this, the, the the unfolding events of the civil rights movement. It was an existential drama, and he was there at the forefront. Mm -hmm. so, but, 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 but Paris, it just seemed like inevitable. When you look back at it now, it seems inevitable. How could he not have had this chapter in his life? And I, and I, and I think he always looked at it that way. Yeah, I agree. Much I agree. more so, so I'll just add a, a, a final postscript. Much more so than Richard Wright. Yes. Who didn't, um, who didn't live a life, live a, a life of um, public engagement in the way that Baldwin did. He led, he led another sort of um, thoroughly interesting life from our point of view historically, but it, it wasn't engaged with current events. I mean, Richard Wright was not really engaged with the civil rights movement yeah. as a beginning in the late 50s. A different mm -hmm. generation. Yeah. If we want to uh, use the bedsheet as a metaphor, 
Um, <laughs> yeah. The uh, eight day in Paris, it was eight days in jail. Yeah. If he'd been caught with that bed sheet in the U.S., he would have been lynched with it. Hmm. That's very so, apropos. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I wonder. Uh, there's a question about French writers. Were there any that you think influenced him or inspired him? Um, not really. No. In No Name in the Street, the book that Cliff mentioned earlier, which was published in 1972 and has some Paris memoirs, he mentions Camus, he mentions uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, he mentions my own particular favorite, Boris Vian, a novelist and singer and trumpet player. Uh, but no, I don't think he was um, taking them on. He wasn't, he wasn't involved in French literary life in that mm. way. He, you know, he, he liked uh, the old boys, uh, Balzac, uh, and Stendhal and that kind of thing. Jimmy had a kind of classical tendency when it came to literature. He you did. know, he was old fashioned mm -hmm. in that way. Yes. D Dickens and Balzac and Stendhal and, um, and um, Harriet Beecher Stowe. You know, it was, uh, it was the 19th century. That's what literature really was. Right. Uh, otherwise it was just me and my pals um, writing this and that. We were the future kind mm -hmm. of thing. <laughs> so, but I, no, I, I think I think the answer is not really. Yeah. I think also um, for him, Paris was a larger uh, ethos. I mean, there was a whole thing about Paris as a whole that he was absorbing and living uh, the music, uh, the the culture in a larger way. I I, I agree with you that. That was what was really infusing him, um, and that he was a classicist in so many ways mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. literature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could, could I just insert there? Um, I, you know, the first question you asked, you know, what what drew us uh, to to Baldwin, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, part of the answer is it has to do with his style. And I mean, I, I found Baldwin. Yeah, he he was very much um, uh, rooted in in sort of a classic classic literature, and but he was raised in the church, and I, I think his his style is, is to me a really just fascinating blend of those two things. You know, he he has the 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 sort of um, you know these sort of Henry Jamesian uh, long sentences with 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 so many commas and semicolons and the whole thing. But also that sort of uh, preacherly cadence, you know, uh, a part of which is is, is repetition. You know, there, there's he he just affects this this music with uh, with with this with these this repetition of phrases, and um, you know that that is certainly evident in uh, I think uh, in uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain and and uh, Notes of Notes of a Native Son. This sort of um, this this just American hybrid, you know, that that I think he uh, just represents. So just wanted to toss that. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah. I I agree. You know, I don't know if you recently know that uh, ABC Television in New York recently released a video interview with Baldwin that happened, I think, in '79, that mm. was never aired. Mm. And getting back to the change we were talking about uh, earlier in his later life, what, what was uh, he saying? How was he saying it? And the, the uh, producers who were releasing it postulate that ABC was for the show 2020 uh, mm -hmm. in 1979. And they did release it. And it was postulated that they didn't release it because he, Baldwin seemed too angry and that his uh, presentation was much more confrontational um, than they felt their viewers were interested in it. And there's clips on, on Vimeo, you, so you can actually see it. But one of the things Baldwin says in this interview is, white people go around, it seems to me, with a very carefully suppressed terror of black people, a tremendous uneasiness, 
they don't know what the black face hides, they're sure it hides something. What it's hiding is American history. Mm. And I, I think that is some of the, the things mm -hmm. that infuse his writing later. And I think it's some of the things that the current Black Lives Movement as, is touching on. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's not about mm -hmm. healing from slavery and racism. It's about revealing that past and having mm -hmm. the institutions acknowledge it. Thoughts? Mm -hmm. it, it, that, it, it's such a wonderful quotation from that uh, interview. And I can easily imagine Baldwin being uh, very angry. Uh, it, it should be said that he would be angry on Wednesday and not on Thursday, or even angry on Wednesday morning and not on Wednesday afternoon. That was but his certainly, gift. Certainly he, he would, could be angry. And that's a marvelous uh, quotation you gave us, Jewel. It, it leads me to something else that I would like to bring up, which is very, little talked about and it, it it emerges from what you've just said something that Baldwin believed in and stated late in his life was his regret that white American writers novelists in particular had neglected the black persons in American life and he said, it was in an interview in the New York Times with Julius Lester mm -hmm. in, I think, uh, 1984. And if you don't mind, I'll just read his words rather mm -hmm. than try to paraphrase them. I quote them in the introduction uh, to the new edition of my book, but it's much better that I, if you allow me to uh, read what he actually said. Um, yeah. It, and it, it, it emerges from his defense of William Styron in writing uh, um, Matt Turner. Mm -hmm. uh, and he made this uh, quoted remark, he has begun the common history, ours. That's Baldwin talking mm -hmm. Byron, Matt Turner. And then it's this, this is what I say, and it leads into Baldwin's actual words. It was in the same spirit that Baldwin tried to bring to the attention of his contemporaries the fact that, as he wrote in 1984, the conundrum of color is the inheritance of every American. Mm. Mm. End of quote. Mm. By that stage, he was willing to admit that his effort to arouse their awareness of this inheritance had failed. In an interview with Julius Lester, published in the New York Times Book Review, I think it's 1984, he stated his belief that, quote, the effort on the part of the Republic to avoid the presence of black people reflects itself in American literature fatally to the detriment of that literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, that is an invitation to white writers to write about black people, to include black people in their books. And if they're not doing it, they're neglecting their duties. Mm -hmm. Tell I, me if I'm wrong. I don't think you're wrong. <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the other things that Baldwin says in this new, newly released interview is that slavery put a curse on us. And it's a curse um, not just on uh, Black people, but a curse on this country mm -hmm. that, you know, the current demonstrations and attention um, are insisting we break through that curse. Mm -hmm. we hope, if we hope to have uh, the de democracy that we, we were originally promised, you know, mm -hmm. as, as Baldwin mm -hmm. also said. Um, someone in the questions wanted to know if Baldwin ever took any position on some of the thorny French political issues like Algerian war and immigration. 
uh, colonialism. Also asked if he had uh, thoughts about Franz Fanon. Do either of you have uh, something to say on those topics? I, I can't speak to the Fanon uh, question, but I, I, I do recall that, uh, I, I remember um, there's a wonderful documentary, which is, I don't know why it's not more widely available called The Price of the Ticket. And uh, mm. um, my, my, you know, Maya Angelou who spent uh, time with Baldwin said that uh, um, Baldwin's comment on, on the Algerian situation in, in, in France was that um, Algerians are the niggers of France. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so, you know, if, 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 uh, if the police didn't, uh, you know, treat Baldwin particularly badly because he was a black American, it's because they, they had their own, they had their own version of him. They had a, kind of a homegrown version. Um, yeah. So anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did he ever yeah. talk about Fanon? I can't recall in all of my yeah. reading. There's a mention in No Name in the Street, but um, I, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, elaborated, oh, uh -huh. not yeah. very much, really. It would be interesting to go back and read Fanon sort of in tandem with some of the essays, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because the philosophical groundings are certainly there in both of the writers, sure. and the intellectual rigor is, yeah. is certainly uh, similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do either of you feel as if, and I'm waiting for more questions, so if anyone has them, please post them. Um, does any, either of you feel that scholarship and in many ways a sort of educational systems in the US failed Baldwin, failed to keep him in the canon? Or is that just a nature, as we talked about earlier, sort of times changing, tastes mm. changing? Mm. Uh, I, I don't know about that because I don't live in the United States and of course I wasn't, edu wasn't educated in the United States. <laughs> that shouldn't uh, stop you from having an opinion. Go ahead. No, 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 of course. Uh, give me all the more reason to have it. But um, I do occasionally reflect that in 1974, 75, 76, I was at a university in Scotland and we were studying Ralph Ellison and Namiri Baraka and uh, um, William Melvin Kelly. I mean, black writers are not that well known now, uh, not to mention, of course, James Baldwin and Richard Wright uh, um, and Native American writers. So it was, that, it comes as a, a surprise to me, really, to discover or to be told that. Baldwin wasn't part of a course in, um, in any American university at the same time. And we're talking about the mid 1970s. Uh, it was tremendously exciting to us as young people at the time uh, to be confronted with all this stuff and to be expected to take it in and, um, and to, to be asked to appreciate the the wonders of language, not to mention uh, ideas in the works of Ellison and Baraka and Baldwin and uh, others. Strangely enough, we didn't uh, study Toni Morrison. She hadn't yet arrived on the scene in big time. That's, it's odd, but we didn't. Um, so if Baldwin is left off of American courses in the 1980s and the 1990s. There's, there's one way of looking at it, which is the kind of obvious one. But I think there's another way of looking at it is that he had fallen out of fashion. Fashion, fashion is a very, very cruel arbiter in literature as in anything else. And reputations go up and they go down. Yeah. And some of them come back up, and his has, <laughs> happily. Yeah. But not all do. There are many, many very good writers that we could all be reading now. Tomorrow, you know, we could, we could, we could pick out books, open books of, of really terrific writers that yeah. we, we probably won't, and we probably will never hear of them again. Right. So it's a, it's a cruel, cruel business. And I wouldn't necessarily rush uh, to the explanation of racism 
for the exclusion of Baldwin. There, there may well be something in that, yeah. but I wouldn't necessarily rush to it. I do think that fashion is cruel, mm. as in anything else. Yeah. yeah. And now, you know, he, he is, he's back in fashion. So um, yeah. let's, <laughs> let's sing about it's it. Celebrate. You know, <laughs> right. Eddie Gloud's uh, book, Begin Again, I thought had such an apt title because mm. it brings us back to Baldwin. And in many ways, I think um, the, um, the sort of slippage of Baldwin's reputation had as much to do with his intellectualism and mm. the intellectual approach he had to in all of his writing and his that brilliant language that we love the taste of, I think sometimes didn't suit uh, the kind of activist writing that some professors wanted to use as a way to describe what was going on in racism in this country. So mm. I would say that's as much a part of it as anything. Mm. I, you know, I, I don't, uh, I, I think, I think James is right uh, that, that, uh, you know, uh, fashion does play a part and, and it's, and it's cruel and it's, uh, um, I, I do think, um, I think, I think Baldwin's work belongs in that sort of permanently established uh, 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 canon, you know, of, 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 of literature. And I, and I, well, I'll just tell you a story and you can sort of extrapolate from there where, where um, you know, uh, how, how universal, uh, Baldwin has, how universally Baldwin has been, has been embraced, uh, by the Academy. I, I was teaching several years ago at a, a, a pretty, uh, a pretty prominent college, pretty, a, pr a pretty prestigious college. And, um, I was teaching writing and I, I assigned, uh, um, an essay of Baldwin's and, um, uh, I also mentioned a, a, a documentary that had just come out at the time about Baldwin. Um, I am Natural Negro, mm -hmm. and and somebody in the class said, "Oh, you know, I, I I saw that documentary, but I didn't realize it was the same guy." So, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. so you know, if this is at all representative of uh, of of, of uh, you know uh, a lot of young people's understanding of where he where he fits in American literature, then I, then I think. Uh, um, well, let, let me just say that it's good that he's having a moment now, and, and, mm -hmm. and I, hope, I hope that it I hope that it permanently takes this time. Right. I have to just say because it is June and it is Pride Month, mm -hmm. um, despite uh, Baldwin's uneasy relationship with any kind of gay activism, we in the queer community, of course, embraced him and his ability to live openly as a gay man, which uh, would cause no no end of trauma uh, for him certainly, and and so that he has been embraced as an icon by our movement for uh, self realization as queer people. And one of the things about uh, Giovanni's room that's so amazing to me is it's it's about that relationship between the two men, the two white characters. But it's also about so much more. It's about, I think it's about colonialism. I think it's about class. And that to me is the brilliance of the book to bring together so many social issues in a, a tight, small, sad story. Mm -hmm. Tragic story, really. Yeah, yeah. And I think that speaks to, to his genius. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody asked about Mark Twain um, that there are that the non-black writers who have spoken and written um, uh, about um, black Americans uh, they <coughs> Mark Twain as one. And I think there's there's something different that I think Baldwin is was calling for, as we talked about earlier. he he's, calling not just for them to write about black characters, but to write about the social world that was created by the introduction of uh, oppression and slavery. And um, that's more, I think, what Baldwin was asking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I, I was just going to refer to uh, James's comment about uh, uh, Baldwin calling for uh, or seeming to seeming to call for white writers to write of, uh, about black characters. And I, I was just thinking, you know, you also mentioned Toni Morrison, and I, I was just thinking that his comment sort of uh, anticipates uh, uh, Toni Morrison's book Playing in the Dark, you know, the, uh, the, the thesis of which is that um, uh, if you really, if you look closely at, at American literature, you, you can, the, the, the impact of having, of, of the presence of black people is detectable even when there aren't black characters. Mm. Um, and, and, uh, and, and it may not, I mean, it, it may be as much the fault of, of critics as of, as of writers that, uh, you know, that we don't perceive, uh, a, a, you know, uh, so much of American literature as, as addressing, um, as addressing race and, 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 and the presence of black people. I think that's, yeah. um, that's a, a subtle comment, yeah. Liv, and it uh, derives also from the work of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, your hero, Albert Murray, mm. and uh, mm. another one of mine, Ralph Ellison. Yeah. And Ellison says something somewhere along the lines of white kids should be asking themselves how black they are. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the music yeah. they listen to, the yeah. way they dress, their gestures, yeah. their cool, yeah. you know, all this kind of stuff. It's all introduced from uh, the black world. Yes. Uh, even though people don't necessarily realize it. Yes. I think yeah. that would be an amazing investigation yeah. of yeah. how black they are and <laughs> the world from which... Um, their culture uh, has emerged. And um, James Baldwin was certainly the witness that we needed uh, as this world has been coming of age and will continue to resonate. I think his work will continue to resonate yeah. uh, for forever, really. Uh, I'm happy you're gonna have another, uh, Mechanics Institute is gonna have another discussion of Baldwin with Eddie Gloud. Uh, in July, late in July, that should be very exciting. I think there's, as we see now, there's so many things we could be talking about yeah. uh, with James Baldwin. His, his ability to engender discussion and conversation is monumental. Mm. Thank you. Thank you both for joining us here. Um, and we have it. Want, uh, Jewel and, and panels, we do have, a, we have time for a few more questions. So Pam can read out a few more questions. Uh, that come up. Do we have any in the chat or in the Q and A? Oh uh, yes, we have. We have some in both. Um, one from you is: How did his work in theater give voice to his work? Ah, good. Yes, mm. very good question. Um, well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was. You know, when you think about it, he was a novelist, an essayist, a dramatist and uh, latterly a poet, and of course a polemicist. Um, you know, come on, modern writers, get the point. <laughs> <laughs> Try and live up yeah. to this. Yeah, right, right. Uh, yeah, he, I think he loved uh, the stage. He loved the idea of the stage. He was very theatrical in his, um, in his, uh, in his being, in his everyday life, he loved the idea, and he loved the idea of working with other people, mm. which of course uh, the theater is all about. Mm. So the, the, the notion of drama was very, very close to his center. Uh, the Amen Corner, I think, was actually the second major piece that he set out to write. Mm. Um, and it was, Go Tell It on the Mountain was an old black world, and so was the Amen Corner. So that's rather interesting. You've got these first two works, uh, exclusively black, and then a third work, Giovanni's Room, exclusively white. Mm -hmm. And it's a sign of great versatility, in, in, <laughs> in my view. This is yeah. the way people should be going about things. Yeah. Uh, but he, he loved that idea, um, and of being there on the stage. And, and he even loved the, the idea of the name and the lights. You know, let's not leave that out. He, oh boy, he liked that. <laughs> there, there's a story that when um, Blue Smith of Charlie was being produced on Broadway, 
1964, uh, he approached the theater, the anti-theater, uh, with uh, a, a young man called Jerome Smith, who was one of the Freedom Riders in Mississippi, and who was badly beaten for heroic actions. Um, and there's a story which a friend of uh, Bolden's and mine, Robert Cordier, told me. Um, Robert Cordier was involved in the But uh, as they approached the theater, uh, Bolden was nervous, of course, the first night. And uh, there was the, the, the name of the play and the name of the playwright. And as they approached from, you know, walk away or something, Bolden said to Jerome Smith, can you, can you see those lights from here? And Jerome Smith said, you can see those lights all the way from Mississippi. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's yeah. great. Jules, yeah. since you yeah. have that, Jules, since you've had the experience of, of writing a play and producing play plays, can you respond to his to the same question about uh, the impact of being in the theater or directing and having it on the stage? I think um, one of the things that came to mind for me with that question was his relationship to Lorraine Hansberry. I mean, they were very mm -hmm. close. Mm -hmm. And I can see how her uh, ventures into drama uh, affected him. And I think he used theater as a way to um, express the musical, lyrical nature of the black community. It was of course a way to introduce the ideas and the politics, but having the voices out loud on the stage, which I found, you know, I decided to write a play about a moment in James Baldwin's life because that was the only way I felt I could do justice to the lyrical quality of his speaking voice and to the culture in which he had grown up. Uh, and I, I think I would venture to, to feel that that's true of him and his approach to drama, his using drama to bring to life the voices that were in his head in many ways. I just wanted to add that uh, um, one, of, one of the first Baldwin novels I read was uh, Tell Me How Long the Train's Been Gone, uh, mm -hmm. whose, whose central character, Leo Proudhammer, is an actor. So. It, yeah. You know, uh, that, so it also, you know, it influenced him that way. You know, he, he yeah. And, and, you know, Leo Proudhammer was kind of a, a, an alter ego of, of Baldwin. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's significant that he made that character an actor. So, yes. Yeah. And yeah. the name alone is just, uh, there's a PhD <laughs> thesis in the Leo Proudhammer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he yeah. was a Leo. He was a and Leo. Was a Leo. Ah, <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh boy. And of course he said about the church, um, he left the church and wanted to go into the theater, but he said, I didn't realize I had been brought up in a theater. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do we have a, a few more questions here that we can just uh, Salute. get to in the last few minutes? Well, we have a question from Genevieve. Where should white readers who want to read more contemporary black writers begin? Might you each name three writers about whose work you thought, wow, people need to know this writer? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's well. the spot. <laughs> <laughs> how, wow. about, how about one? <laughs> I, I um, got to put in a plug for Albert Murray. Yeah. Yeah. Albert Murray. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's so strange uh, to think yeah. about contemporary, I'm sorry, contemporary writers. Um, I think there's uh, some lovely, lovely poets, uh, contemporary poets out there. The uh, young woman, Natalie Diaz, who just won the Pulitzer, is a lovely poet. Um, Cheryl Clark is a fabulous poet, um, contemporary poet who just has a new book out. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not averse to going back a bit, like to Albert Murray, like to Toni Morrison, to get a real honest understanding of where the culture 
has been at its best. Um, or even someone like, uh, you know, the novel Passing by Nella Larson, which was just recently made into an amazing film. Mm. Uh, Nella Larson was someone who wrote a really important book about color in this country that kind of almost drifted out of vision. And that was written in the 1920s. I would say go back to Nella Larson too. James, please. Uh, yeah, uh, there, there are so many. Um, Black American literature is such an integral part of American literature and that it should be stated that way and it shouldn't be forgotten and it shouldn't be set apart. Uh, the, the obvious principles for people of my generation are Baldwin, Ellison and Wright. And you can't, you really, you can't go wrong with those three. But I'm a great believer in exploring. And I'm, I, I'm actually a believer in reading writers that you don't really like very much. You know, and, and 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 finding out why you don't like them, and they tell you why you like the ones you do, mm. and and so there's all sorts of people, and there are things to like in the writers you don't really like all that much. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, American literature of the 20th century is just a, a great modernist, cacophonous symphony mm. uh, of, of fabulous experimentation. Yeah. and uh, an exploration and, and uh, th there's nothing better than exploring e exploring one writer to another so to go from Baldwin to Baraka is great to go from Baraka to Nella uh, Larson. Writer, there's a wonderful fiction writer contemporary named Brina Clark who uh, just has a new novel out and she writes about primarily life in Washington, D.C. from an African-American perspective. And I think she has both the language and the perspective that uh, we, we long for when we, we miss fiction writers. So I'd say look for Brina Clark. I'll just get one in there real quick. Uh, it's kind of random, but uh, 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 I think an underappreciated novel called The Cheneysville Incident by David Bradley. Yes, uh, Yeah. brilliant. Yeah. That's a brilliant novel, The Cheneysville Incident. Yeah. Quite brilliant. Yeah. Right. And with There's so much, and we're, and we're, we're so lucky today, mm. uh, we can get anything we like. Yeah. You know? Yes. Yeah. It was different mm -hmm. in, in, in the 1970s. My, you had to cross the Atlantic to get some of these books. Yeah. <laughs> right. You had to cross the ocean. Yeah, That's not the case fine. now. So there's no excuse for not exploring. That's the internet idea. is like Alice's restaurant. You can get anything. <laughs> <laughs> Someone and mentioned not... Octavia Butler. Yeah, Octavia yeah. Butler. Great. Yay! Uh, I want to put, put in a plug that uh, Cal Shakes is also also doing a program on Octavia Butler. It was also uh, one of the things we were considering, but we this time around we chose. Uh, James Baldwin, Baldwin, because our last tribute was about uh, Toni Morrison. But before yeah. we close our program, I want to, first of all, bring attention to our author's books, Talking at the Gates, A Life of James Baldwin uh, by James Campbell. This so you get a little visual. You can see <laughs> I've got a lot of post-it notes on that one. And also um, Clifford Thompson's book, What It Is. Uh, Ray's family and one thinking black man's blues. Really beautiful. Are these your drawings? Uh, th that is that is my painting on the cover. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's, yeah. there's some beautiful paintings uh, and illustrations in the book. And of course, um, Jules' work can be found at bookstores with Giovanni's uh, Waiting for Giovanni <laughs> and oh, also, also her other novels, The Gilda Stories, etc. So on this auspicious day, as we've said, Juneteenth will be a national holiday. Um, and we've had this fabulous conversation to uh, commemorate and celebrate this time and this er era. And we hope that everyone will go out and continue your reading and researching and opening up to all of the ideas and inspirations of and and prophetic words as we've said of of james baldwin and also of everyone here so thank you everyone and uh come back to our zoom programs 
Remember, we've got our another, another program with Eddie Gloud on July 29th, 530, and we hope to see you then. Mm. Thank you. Bonsoir. Bonsoir.